Um, I'm Mike Brack and I was the uh, founder of the Government Digital Service in 2011 um, and I now run an organisation called Public Digital. We help around 20 governments and large organisations with a public mission around the world to transform digitally and create better service for millions of people. We only really work at scale. Um, in my career I've worked at a variety of sectors and countries, notably on the board of The Guardian, uh, which is arguably one of the global digital news transformations. And I've worked uh, in, as I say, in 15 countries. I've had my own technology companies. One failed, one succeeded. So that's a pretty much a good track record. Hello. I'm Henri Verdier. I, now I'm the ambas ambassador for digital affairs. So I work uh, about cyber criminality, uh, internet governance, uh, hate speech, uh, fake news, etc. But I started the, f f once I started three companies, so I'm a French entrepreneur, um, I came within the government to in charge of open data and open government. And um, in 2015, I started the DINZIC, which was a kind of a French GDS. And Mike Bracken was a great inspirator for me. <laughs> so I'm very proud to discuss with you today. I'm delighted you're now an ambassador. So. We now have operators in the political class, so it's terrific. Well, in terms of tools, not much, because it's the same stuff. Um, in terms of values and mission, everything, the public sector has a much more different uh, and important set of values to society than many organisations in the private sector, and consequently needs to think about how it uses digital tools and services um, to the benefit of everybody. Um, uh, uh, Richard Pope, one of the best developers I work with, famously said, you know, software is politics now. And I believe that because our political systems and our systems of government are now derived by the tools we use and how we interact with them. And it, it, the choices we make around technology and software and services are now fundamentally choices we make about how we govern and organize ourselves. They are that important. And those choices cannot be left to West Coast platform technology companies. They must be made at the centre of government by people who understand the importance of those choices. And Henri is one of those people. I agree. The, for, for me, there are more differences between um, innovators and uh, conservatives than between public and private sectors. And for example, there are some companies that are very old bureaucracy, <laughs> and there are some public organization, uh, very innovative. And the differences are, are not what people think. You can find good developers, uh, very engaged people uh, within the public action. But we have two, w I think that we in public action, we have one chance and one difficulty. The difficulty is that we have no need of customer. Traditionally, government are strong. <laughs> you have to pay taxes. <laughs> you, you want to, to have the subsidies. And we don't have to find customers, so user experience, uh, simplicity it, uh, are difficult to implement within government action. And we have one asset, is that because we are in charge of general interest, we can easily work on open source model and we can easily find um, uh, allies with um, OpenStreetMap, with uh, a lot of people want to help the government. So it's different, it's very different. But it's not a difference between private or public uh, status. Well, I, I think there are many obstacles. And to transform in the public sector, one needs to actually undertake reforms in many areas concurrently. So procurement, recruitment, uh, finance, changing from a big capex model to an opex model all of these things need to happen and they all need to happen roughly at the same time to get the outcomes that you need the context of each country is different obviously but roughly they are there but i would argue that each of those things are known problems they can be solved they're difficult it's not complex it's just hard there's hard to solve problems the biggest problem actually is the one that we're not talking about enough which is our very systems and structures of government how we are set up is a byproduct in the UK from, from the empire, from a Victorian system of government. 
and it's simply not fit for purpose in a digital age. And the conversation we need to have at a political level as well as a government level is saying, are we set up right? Why do we even have departments? Or why do we have so many of them? We have 28 in the UK and 300 agencies. Why do we need all those parts of government? Because digitally, we can cut through a lot of these things very quickly and in a different way. And it's interesting to me that three of our leading politicians, Brown, uh, sorry, Blair, Clegg and Cameron, have come to the end of their time in government and said, our system of government's not set up right in a digital age. And they're all three very different politicians. And for me, I think the defining challenge of our, of our era will be what does, a new, what does a truly digital government look like in terms of its shape and its mechanics? Yes, I totally agree. We designed those organizations uh, in a time where uh, people weren't educated. Information was uh, very rare <laughs> and expensive and communication were very slow. Yeah. So we did invent something very strong, but in this specific context and now People are very educated, they can organize themselves, cooperate, innovate, and uh, information is very ab abundant, and we can communicate and synchronize, etc. And, but we have this discussion, we have two specific difficulties because of this problem of context and design. One is uh, that the bureaucratic organization is not a good one to make products, because uh, a good product is a product with uh, users. And just the users know if it's a good product. It's not the hierarchy, it's the client. And the second difficulty is instability, because uh, I don't know any company that can survive uh, uh, changing the, the COMEX uh, every three years. It's impossible, and uh, public action change very <laughs> often the governance, and that's very difficult. I, th I think that's, that's entirely right. And in the UK, one of the things we did fa from necessity is we we changed what those services had to look like to suit user need. M most governments, what they do is we had we replaced two and a half thousand websites, just to put them all onto one common website, gov.uk. And in doing so, we challenge we we met a a user need, which was when a user, whatever that user is, a teacher, a refugee, an immigrant, a prisoner, a benefit claimant, doesn't matter. We have lots of words for users. Whatever you're using the public services, it, you, you, you can recognize it's government. Because prior to that, what we said was, look, we have two and a half thousand websites. None of them look the same. You have to learn how to use them. And often they're from parts of government that you don't even know what, the government, what it is there to do. The skills funding agency or the education funding agency. Who knows? So to actually put a different brand on that and say it's all part of one thing, was the biggest change we made. So those bureaucrats couldn't say, well, we are special and unique and different over here than we are over here, because most of government is pretty much service design all of the time. And I think that the single domain model was the, was the British way to solve some of that. And, and I think that it's, it's too easy to say every country should have it, but I wonder how you can get these disparate parts of government to feel like they're part of a whole a bit more using the, you can usually say, the, the content design, the user experience, because that was our model. Of you, you did start more than France by the design, and the, the principle of web design from the GDS must be teached in every public school. That's very, you, you made a great job. And we started more by the back office and government as a platform, data, that is useful also, but you start in you have the lead so. about design. Yes, <laughs> of course. Sure, but as I say, that was via necessity because our problem was so profound mm. that nobody could find anything. Mm. I think you don't have so much that problem. Uh, maybe because we we are more Jacobin, <laughs> so more organized at the beginning. Yeah, we were not organized at all. Mm. I'll talk about the UK. My, my colleagues in the UK government do a remarkable job from being on the border ports when we're dealing with Ebola virus to terrorism to all sorts of things. And yet they are almost dropped in with generic skills at each point by the thousands to deal with usually a crisis or an emergent issue. 
I think in the world, the digital world we're in, that government needs to be much more agile and able to respond with specialist responses to specialist, to, to special environments and, uh, and circumstances. And they're not able to do that with big, big battalions and big departments. They're just not quick enough to react. And we're seeing that with Brexit right now in terms of the UK, although I don't agree with Brexit at all. You, one could argue it's an opportunity to change a lot of things. The British government simply lacks the speed and, and, and expertise to change its tax and customs arrangements because it just doesn't have the ability inside it to do it. It's re reliance on third parties who take several years. So I think what people will see is how can government move more quickly and react more quickly to user needs when the device in my pocket can provide me with the services I want like that. And that disparity where governments move too slowly and third parties move very quickly means that people will be more reliant on those third parties and intermediaries, possibly for government service or government-like information. And that's not a healthy position for government. Yes, of course. I think often that the lack of trust about institution is because the service is not the same quality. And we can change everything. We can make better services, new services, new securities, new, more, m much more empowerment, less expensive. But for me, the, the most important is, is that we, we will, it will happen with or without us, change this, the very idea of what is a government, what is a government for. Because we try to build democracy. So government of the people, by the people, for the people. And we, we need more transparency, more uh, implication, more cooperation, uh, more collective intelligence, more, uh, more freedom for the citizen. And uh, probably the idea of a government that knows everything and decides everything and uh, is will disappear. It's, and we, we, we need something else, <laughs> something more intelligent. I think it's not the ability that government... It's, it's not the ability or the positioning of government to know everything. People have come in the UK from a, a welfare state post the Second World War where government is provide cradle to the grave services. And it feels very comfortable, like the government will provide everything or will sort it out. And we're in a position now where we're going, it's not that I want the government to provide everything, but I would like the government to have the ability to find the information it needs quickly and react to it. And the fact that that information about, as I'm sitting here in Paris, the real-time information about traffic in London is probably held better by Uber and Google than it is by Transport for London, is not a healthy position for our democracy. And there's got to be a way that we can leverage the benefits of this digital experience for, for wider society rather than for a few platform players. And we will have to face new issues. Artificial intelligence uh, and the, the impact on uh, public action, uh, cyber criminality, uh, of course, uh, the domination of the world economy by huge platforms. Yes. So we, we need to provide new resources. Absolutely. One of the, one of the curious things about government is its profound lack of looking into the middle distance. Governments are very good at looking at the long term. In this building, I am sure there will be people looking at long-term economic strategy. They should be, right? There's lots of them. And that's a, a, a well-understood economic skill. And there are also people reacting to the short-term things, uh, the police reacting to an incident or something today. But the technology change happens in the middle distance. It's not true that most technology change is sort of quite rapid. The things that we've deployed in products and services that you and I have created have been well understood in Silicon Valley and elsewhere for 10, 15 years. Agile ways of working, open source code. I've been doing this stuff for 20 years. So we could sit here now and confidently predict that m the worry for my children will not be that when, when they're old enough to have a phone that they're playing a video game. The worry is that they'll be, it'll be AR and VR. Now, I don't know quite that what they will look like, but they'll be in environments that today we can't understand. But we know that's coming, so we can start to think about that now. But what governments very rarely do is to think about what happens in, with technology in five to seven years out. They do long-term planning and very short-term reaction, and I think that's a, 
a thing that we, we should be looking at is that we can see into the near future with technology, internet views, and its effects on society. The effects of, of emergent technologies like the, the big switch to voice in search is a massive issue. Our security services understand that, most parts of our government don't. And those things, those trends and those changes are things we need to react to much more quickly. To do that, you need people like yourself in government who have either a political role or ambassadorial role, but who understand how stuff is made. And we don't have enough of people like you in, in our governments. Yes. Obviously, politics has to be in something very short term, and administration thinks she has eternity for, for them. <laughs> and between, the, between both, <laughs> we have a problem. <laughs>
most companies can use their products. <laughs> For me, so at the beginning, th there were so many challenges that uh, it was very difficult to choose one. Uh, one that a lot of people don't uh, know that one challenge is that we have a cultural battle within the IT sector also. We have old IT and new IT. <laughs> we have and part of the problem is the old IT. So a lot of people don't know this. Uh, at the end of my mission, I think that we have two main uh, issues. Uh, much more important than the other. One is uh, management and the other is organization. And um, they are not tech issues, but with an old bureaucracy, you cannot build a strong IT. Uh, I'm sure of, of this. Because you, you need to be able to, to hire the good people at the good mo just in time when you need him. You need to organize uh, some autonomy to the people, strategic autonomy, technical autonomy, and to regulate this. And, uh, and for me, the, the, the most d difficult is to design a new organization and new management uh, principle. Um, what do you think about this? Utterly agree. <laughs> All those problems, lack of people, skills, the false certainty required by the finance system, problematic management, too many competing agendas, not knowing your users, all of those skills, how to reform everything, procurement, all the rest of it. But you're absolutely right. The fundamental problem is that you're trying to do that on the wrong landscape, literally in the wrong environment, because I very quickly walked around government saying, why are we set up like this? Why do we have in the UK three different parts of government that effectively give money to students? Why, why do we do that? Now, we do that because of some regulation back in 1962, but why they exist now, and just, there's literally no reason for them to exist. So who is looking at that going, we're just not set up right? Because those organisations, all government organisations, the sovereignty of the organisations means that they think themselves more important than their users. And the users don't care how we structure ourselves, they just care about the services. So really it's, it's time for a, uh, a debate about what should a government look like in a digital age. I would argue you could reduce the, the departmental structure down to five. You could probably get five major areas of government that require a big institution to run them. The rest of it can probably run by ad hoc project teams. Yes, you, can see, you have to think in terms of uh, number of organisations. For me, it's more horizontal. It's uh, autonomy of the people we are actually dealing with the citizen. And can we empower them to make a better job? Or do we think that some guys at the top of the pyramid knows what they have to do and how and when and why? And uh, That's right. The closer you can get, empower people who are close to the users is what, what you need to do. I mean, the, the, the f I can only talk about the UK. I imagine it's the same here. But that problem was really embodied by policy. Because in the UK, we have lots of people in government, but people who have got a policy job are the most important. And, you know, they would, I would come in, they'd say, well, you know, you might be an IT guy, but, you know, I write policy. And I'd be like, I know, but your policies are literally undeliverable. You're writing them in your head, but I'm going to take it to show some users who are using the results of your policy and watch them start crying or be unable to use it because your policies are written, as you say, for people like yourself who are wealthy, educated, elitist to some degree in, London, in Paris or London, but not the people who actually use them, not the prisoners or the people that the, in, in difficult circumstances in society. And that lack of empathy within our policy uh, uh, group is, was a real profound shock to me. Uh, maybe we can use uh technology to simplify also the policies. For example, in France, one project we are very proud of is Open Fisca. So we did build the, the model of the com complete uh, social and tax system. They are 40,000 40, rules, intricated, and we give the on open source the model. And now people, newspapers, uh, researchers, and uh, parliament can modelize the effect of a law between during the debate and that's the first time we can vote a bill 
knowing exactly the consequences. That's, I mean, that's hugely important. Building those tools that allowed people to do that is hugely mm -hmm. important. So a, a similar one in the UK is the tax system. Now the tax system is, you know, if you write it down, it's this big. And it's full of very long words that only solicitors understand. But if you actually take the time to write it in, in our case, plain English that people can deal with, mm -hmm. suddenly there's a huge amount of interest and also you stop having people paying thousands of pounds of solicitors to just basically translate this stuff. Yeah. So these, these sorts of bringing simplicity to these machinery of government is, is crucial. And as you, you say, you don't need a department to do that. Mm. Well, in France, in this time, we, we think a lot about um, exclusion or inclusion, digital exclusion. So of course, you, you have problems if people don't have internet. But you have problem if people have some uh, health issue, so they are blind. Or yeah. But you have also problem if they, if they don't understand this language. Yeah. And you can exclude people because they don't speak like a high public servant. Yes, the average reading age in the UK is 12. And we made sure that all our content was read. 40% of content, of literally words on a page, we got rid of because no one ever read them. And then we tested all the rest of it and made it as simple as possible. So specialist areas of government like tax, we had like this with the, with the tax policy of saying like, I don't care how many long tax words you know, if nobody understands them, there's no point publishing them. And so we had to make them write them in simple English again. And that's like, that is the job of government. You don't need blockchain or big data to do that. You just need a very, very consistent style guide for how you write for people and make the machinery of government simple. That's another important idea, sorry, because you want to, <laughs> to end the discussion. A lot of people ask us to make big data, blockchain, and we have so many victories possible with very simple technologies, or without technologies, <laughs> just doing a good job, very, very simple. I was also the first uh, chief data officer of France, and we m tried to use big data uh, to solve problem, but the ten first projects were uh, just with Excel and a simple uh, <laughs> personal computer. It was it didn't need uh, artificial intelligence, or I don't know. Uh, did you I see the same? Have all the time, and and because the technology industry is very good at selling these phrases, big data, blockchain, mm. you know, artificial intelligence. Then, then they usually sell them to senior people who say, oh, I want some of this. And then you have to actually unpick them and go, what is it that you want? But you just, the, the number of times people have said to me, I need blockchain, or this, and I've said, okay, your website's broken. Should we fix your website first? Like people can't find, you know, it's real simple stuff. Now, once you've done that, yes, in some cases there's a need for advanced technology. But as you know, as a data officer, even in government, the, the quality of training data is usually very poor. So just sorting out the training data before you can move to sort of any machine learning capability is a profound cleansing job. But people, you know, it's the hard work of government to sort these problems out. And people need to understand that it's not just a, a, a sort of a catchphrase. In fact, in France, it's a bit the contrary. We have a lot of very good data. So you just, you just have to look the data to find new results. For example, every time you hire someone in France, you have to, to make a declaration préalable uh, and to write to the administration, I will hire this guy. With this, and just with this, we could predict uh, companies that will hire us in the next six months. And to, to say to unemployed people, you should make a spontaneous condition. <laughs> and we, in a few months, we have 20% more um, job for these guys than without this tool. It was very efficient and it was just to have a look to this amount of data that no one ever did, did use. Yeah, well that's great. That I, I'm glad you have that data, rich data set. We just didn't have it in the UK. In fact, you have some. some. Well, we have some, okay. but in terms of what... But France is more centralized, yes, of course. But what, we, can, what, we are allowed, what we are allowed to use for training data is mm. restricted. I did too much remedial work because I had to. I regret having to just do all the basics because in the UK we had just not looked at the basics for 15 years. We had outsourced everything and it was a mess. So I regret that. 
and as a consequence I regret not doing enough work on the future organization of the state and the design of the state. We were doing too much fixing of the old version and not enough creating of the new. And I also regret not making the working lives of some of our internal colleagues better. Those people who are triple keying on the ERP systems, you know, we could have made their lives better as well as the users of, of services. So they're, they're my two regrets. And I, had we gone on longer, I think the conversations that I've had with Henri and, uh, and a few other people who, about how we set up digital nation states is, is a central conversation that we need to have. Yes, what I changed is, uh, I, I spoke about this, is that now I think that it's more a matter of organization and management than a matter of technology. Now I ask me very often what will remain. <laughs> and uh, I think that will remain uh, the law. So when we succeed, in, for example, about open data, uh, we change the law. So, so tools like France Connect, like Open Fisca, like uh, I don't know, and communities, people uh, liking together, working together. And maybe I regret that I um, work uh, too much because the rest <laughs> don't matter. One year later, <laughs> it's finished and you need law, tools and communities. And we spend a lot of time to bullshit re <laughs> meetings and uh <laughs> it's a quote, huh? I don't say bullshit. I it's a quote about David Graeber. <laughs> I, th I, think I, I think there's no regrets is ever putting time into a community of practice. In the UK, for, for instance, there was no service design culture when we arrived because all the services were outsourced. Um, there is now a vibrant service design culture. Th there are conferences where everyone goes to. Service design in government is a thing. It's a big cultural phenomenon. And that will that alone will outlast any individual action or benefit that Henri or I will take. It's setting those communities up who will do that work for decades in future. So I, I think the thing not to regret is to invest in, in communities of practice because those people in the UK, regardless of what happens, will not go back to working in a way that we were working in 2010. They, they won't sit around and say, yeah, we're going to do a five-year, ten-year deal with an IT supplier and wait two years for something to be delivered. They just won't work that way. And, and that's the, the no regrets investment. Um, in our last book, we have a book, Digital Transformation at Scale, Why the Strategy is Delivery. Um, and it's basically a, a guidebook for people setting up digital teams uh, and effecting large-scale transformation. And I've been asked why the question, well, why strategy is delivery? Honestly, it's because I was, asked, I was asked to present the digital strategy for the government after 30 days to members of the cabinet, to which point I went, there isn't a digital strategy. We are just going to deliver some things and learn from them. We only actually wrote the strategy 18 months later after we delivered a lot of things. Really, our single point is this. If you have a team working in the right way, the problems they encounter, so long as that you're learning from them, while they're delivering, are a much better way to devise a strategy than writing down words on a page. It's the art of building something, getting close to your users, learning from them and constantly changing is a much better strategy than writing down sort of strategic principles. That's a very important part of the legacy of Mike Bracken and um, I quote you very often. In fact, in the public action, uh, some people just want to announce something, <laughs> some people just want to make a plan some people just want to make a process <laughs> and the only thing that matter is if is if you deliver so it's a very good uh, guide to <laughs> to think every day that i want to deliver something or i waste my time so i did quote you very 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 often until i understood that you said the same thing that the empereur napoleon puisque l'empereur disait la guerre est un art simple tout dans l'exécution <laughs> Tout est dans l'exécution. I, th I think that to have a colleague of mine who does the same things I've done and has done it very well, in many cases much better than we did in the UK, to see you elevated to the ambassador class and the political class is a really great move for France and for you, I hope, 
because I think there are many practitioners like myself around the world who are, have been really unable to operate at that level as well. Maybe a little bit, but not purely at that level. And I think the opportunity you have now to make a new class of ambassador, a new class of political operator across national boundaries digitally is a smart move for France and I hope that it's a good move for you as well because I think that you're now in the lead. There are very few countries that have taken this step and very few people could do it who've got the knowledge of delivery that you have. So good luck. Thank you. We'll try if it's possible to make delivery in the <laughs> diplomatic and international system. We can have a go. <laughs> we'll try. Thank you.